You down with OPP and Heimer? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPP and Heimer? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPP and Heimer? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPP and Heimer? Yes, you know me. <laughs> Yo. We all about this. We about to blow the roof off the, the sucker. Tell the roof off the sucker. Tell the roof off the sucker. Tell the roof off the Oppenheimer. Tell the roof off the sucker. Tell the roof off the sucker. Tell the roof off the Motherheimer. I seen some movies, and then I seen some other things that might not ought to be called movies. They might ought to be called sleep aids. Oppenheimer. More like Nappenheimer. Stole that joke from Jamie. Oppenheimer, more like Sleepenheimer. That's what I said on Twitter. Oppenheimer, a how hour and a half in, and we ain't had no nothing blow up. We ain't even had an M80. Not even a sparkler. Two hours in, we get a little bit of pop fizzle. It took two hours to blow anything up. Where's Michael? Call in Michael Bay. Page in Michael Bay. Help us out the movies gay. Call in Michael Bay. You know an OPP and Heimer? Yeah, you know me. Michael Bay should have been blowing up. There would have been nukes in the first five minutes. We would have had Autobots roll out in five minutes. We didn't even get a sporkler. <laughs> Jamie didn't feel like coming on, but she's in there giggling. So she approves. I stole one of her jokes. We know if Michael Bay was directing it, we would have had a freaking explosion in, in the opening sequence. The opening sequence would have just been explosions blowing up other explosions. We would have had Optimus Prime over there. Given... Oppenheimer a massage. <sighs> Welcome everybody. I was on Lord Voldemort as you probably saw the fourth hour and I didn't get into the deep dive like I wanted to. I ran out of time. I'm not fussing. I'm happy for any of the time that I get. Uh, they skipped the commercial breaks to let me do my my little shtick. My humble little routine. Oh here comes the Movie analyzer, author, comedy man. Ha ha ha. Let him do his little thing. And I ran out of time. I thought I had more time than I did because I couldn't see the clock for like the first 20 minutes of the between the breaks. And so uh, I did. I talked about old Tom Coombe over there. And um, I did that for that large audience, which it did make it onto the front page of their little info zine they got. Then I tried to get to Barbie, but then I only had a few minutes. So let's get into Barbie. Let's do this. Let's do this. You got your Barbies. You get your Kins. There we go. Y'all want to play Barbies with me? <laughs> uh, yeah, so a lot of people were saying too, because I listened to Rachel and, and uh, Jamie talking about Barbie. And Rachel was like, well, how is it Gnostic? Somebody else, uh, uh, I mentioned this. They said, how is it Gnostic? I'm going to tell you how. Y'all going to get learnt. Because, by the way, Hollywood recycles Gnostic narratives all the time. It's like their go-to superstructure narrative for any of this kind of a, a movie, right? Remember Lego movie. Did you notice the parallels with Barbie and Lego movie, even to the point of the Demiurge character being Will Ferrell? That was odd. Um, but yeah, that's what we see over and over. So how is that the case? Well, the movie begins, as I'm sure you know, with the 2001 Space Odyssey sequence. And we see 
the idea that motherhood is slavery. And the girls, the little children uh, from 2001, the little monkeys over there, they're taking the baby dolls and they're bopping other baby dolls and breaking them. Again, spoofing the 2001 Stanley Kubrick. Ever heard of him? That sequence. And the idea is that evolution of women, we're all coming from a primordial matriarchal society. So there's an ideal world, by the way, where Barbie lives, which is different from the human world, which is patterned on the matriarchal world, you see. So the ancient primeval Barbie is the monolith. And the reason she's the monolith is that she is the, uh, the archetype, the ideal at the beginning. She's perfection. She's the Edenic state uh, as the monolith. Yes, it's totally Gnostic. Now, it's not 100% Gnostic in every single sense because we get a recurring theme which we're going to, I'm probably going to do a podcast on this in the, in the near future because this is a, a new thing that they're doing. We covered this with the Psyop Cinema guys. The They mentioned the dark goddess archetype. And I'm kicking that up a level to not just the dark goddess archetype, the dark goddess savior archetype. Because sometimes the dark goddess is also now the new female savior contrasted to the patriarchal religion of the last you know several thousand years <laughs> mosaic religion christianity etc and back to barbie so at the beginning when they're evolving women are evolving uh on the basis of moving towards the barbie archetype so the ancient primal idea of traditional roles is old it's outdated right because the original society, the ideal, is matriarchal. So we, we learn that in the Barbie world, let's see if there's any pictures here. Yeah, so right here, in the Barbie, let's see, I, let's, I wish these pictures would get in the dang middle of things. Yeah. No. In Barbie world, there we go. Everything's ideal. And it's a matriarchal society where there's all female Supreme Court. Just better not commit your crimes and get scheduled on that day of the month. Because you're going to get the book thrown at you. In the matriarchal uh, ideal world, women rule. Uh, men basically serve women in all capacities in the female feminine role. Uh, rolling around in uh, little, you know, roller skates, rolling around in roller skates and uh, pulling, I don't know, ice cream cones out of their fanny packs. That's basically, literally, that's like all they do. And swim in fake waters, right? Uh, but this matriarchal society that's perfect with a all-female Supreme Court and I, I'm having to defend myself because a couple dum-dums tried to debate me on this movie. Like, I got it wrong. Number one, I'm the greatest movie analysis sizer that's ever been in the world. So, you're probably not right, first of all. Because you tried to step to this. You try to step to this, you get smoked. You try to, you try to start a smoke with me, I'm going to start a smoke signal to call my Indian bros. Oh, my, 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 my. You go, you gone. You about to get tomahawked with logic, with a tomahawk of logic flying at your scalp, bro. Cause what happened? They tried to step to me on Twitter. I'm like, let me put you in your place, boy. You ain't talking to no Ken doll. You're talking to Fabio. I'm talking the Fabio of logics, bro. I'm the Fabio of movie analysis, dog. Look at this hair. Trying to step to Fabio hair. I'm almost at Matthew McConaughey phase, bro. You better step off. Anyway, what I'm getting at is that people were arguing with me saying, oh, uh, this was tra tried and based. What? Did you go to the wrong movie? You step in a different movie, dog? Tried and based? This movie was ridiculous. 
This was the most feminist Gnostic movie I've ever seen. So in the matriarchal world, where I think is ideal, where this evolving world is placed as the lower, you know, degraded world, Barbie is still the archetype, the Margot Robbie Barbie. She's the every Barbie, the Ulta, you know, like she's the Barbie that all the other Barbies are basically patterned on. She's the archetype of Arca Barbie, the Barbie type, Barca type, Barba type. Um, and she's the monolith. She's the one that brings them to the next phase of evolution. However, in our fallen world, it evolves into a patriarchy. They make this clear in the film. Who was not listening? The, the people that tried to step to me on Twitter. That's who. Over there asleep. I don't blame you. Both of these movies are essentially sleep bombs sleepenheimer i'm gonna need a i need a mike lindell atomic pillow that's the most powerful sleep you'll ever ex explosive sleep with my new mike lindell atomic pillow perfect for going to see nappenheimer <laughs> that's what i'm talking about well guess what you get a pink one from mike lindell too for barbie my new neon barbie pillows perfect for barbie anyway Barbie in Barbie world, remember, by the way, has her own money, her own job. She does everything on her own, her own career, her own car. Um, it's essentially an egalitarian, matriarchal, fair society. And it's fair because the men submit and they serve the women, literally. Now, as we said, in this world, it's fallen and it's a patriarchy. And they make that clear because eventually when Barbie learns that there's such a thing as death. So she has a gnosis where she comes to learn that there's imperfection and death. This knowledge, this gnosis actually begins to introduce decay, corruption, rebellion in the ideal pretend imaginal world, the Barbie world. She starts to experience burnt toast. She's got sour milk, right? She's got problems. And she goes to weird Barbie Weird Barbie says, if you want to solve this problem, you're going to have to go to the real world and find your handler, the girl that, that, that ha handles you, right? Who, it turns out, was a girl boss, but uh, is a single mom now. And the daughter is a radical social justice warrior. So this lower level thing with the radical social justice warrior uh, daughter, the Gen Z daughter, arguing with her mom, that's what everybody, and then and then having some character development. That's what's making people. Oh, see, it was Trad and Bays because the social justice girl uh, learned that she was too radical. Oh, so right. What we really need is traditional third wave feminism. <laughs> exactly right. So yeah, it's not it's not feminism that is the problem. It's radical, uh, super radical whatever act activism nonsense that the little girl is involved in the, the high school girl right but the real feminism that we need to, the trad based feminism that we need to go back to is the one where barbie is independent don't need no man right now so what's barbie's job to come to the real world to heal and fix her handler person and whatever the problems are that they're going through to get rid of the decay and corruption in the perfect Edenic Barbie world. When she comes to the real world, it turns out that it's dominated by the Mattel corporation, which also controls the ideal world and things have gotten out of whack. And there's a bumbling creator God, Will Ferrell. Creator of, you know, run, the one that run the architect of the Mattel uh, imaginal world, but also has a lot of sway in this world because it's corrupted and run by a patriarchy. In other words, the patriarchal god figure, Yaldabaoth, the uh, creator god, uh, you know, the Demiurge is Will Ferrell. And he rules from a top, the Mattel Corporation in this like heavenly corporate council. When Ken comes to this world with Barbie as her beta sidekick, her beta orbiter, literally, he decides he's going to learn about patriarchy in this world. So he starts studying the corporate world, 
right? And he meets this corporate CEO guy and he's like, hey, I want to be the CEO. And the guy's like, well, uh, you're dressed like a doll. Uh, you can't just be a CEO. And he's like, oh, well, teach me what it is to be a patriarchy. And he's like, well, people think that it's ego- egalitarian and uh, it's feminist, but wink, wink, we all know the patriarchy is corporatism. So corporate con- control is oppressive patriarchal structure uh, it just needs to be filled with women. Now, wait a minute. I thought that corporatism is an oppressive control structure. Oh, but if it's just women oppressors, we won't be oppressed. Okay, so it's not it's not the structure itself that's the oppressor. Because if it's the structure that's oppressive, then just filling it with another bunch of people means that, oh, now it's just power dynamics. It was nothing about the structure. You were just trying to seize power. Well, that's what a, a lot of these uh, postmodern... Uh, activists believe it's nothing to do with truth and falsehood it's about power dynamics and that's what goes on in the movie in the sense that uh barbie sees that this world is a, is a patriarchy and so when her and ken go back to barbie world ken is now infected with the disease of patriarchy and he's literally checked out a bunch of books by men's rights people I mean, did nobody notice this? I mean, it's just like obvious. I can't imagine anyone coming to the dumb conclusion that this was in any way a, quote, trad movie. What? I mean, Ken literally has got freaking Rolo books, basically, okay? And when he gets to Barbie world, he initiates a patriarchal rebellion based on the corporate structure of this world, Right? And so then what happens is that Barbie world turns into a kingdom. Instead of a kingdom, it's kingdom. And Ken there operates and acts like just your average kind of sort of meathead, right? Which are some masculine characteristics, like he wants to be fit. He gets into weightlifting. And he just watches horses running on TV. That I didn't get. I don't understand the... Like every scene is horses running on TV. No idea what that means, but... He basically just lays around and drinks beer and uh, watches horses on TV and exercises and has the women bringing him, uh, you know, cold brews. Beer me. Barbie comes back and realizes that Ken has set up an oppressive patriarchal structure and it's now Barbie's duty to fix the imperfection in Barbie world. She thought she had learned the imperfections and healed things in the real world so that she could come back to Barbie world. But now the problems are not knowledge of death. Now it's the oppressive patriarchal structure. Now, I kid you not, you're not going to believe this, but so then what happens is Barbie and her team dress up in pink sort of communist worker outfits. So basically imagine everybody in their commie garb, but they're all wearing like pink commie black ops outfits pink ops basically and so they because they're so sophisticated and you know women are masters of you know black ops we all know that right they uh engage in a bunch of conspiracy and subterfuge to cause divide and conquer amongst kingdom so they set the two groups two groups of ken's men against one another cause a giant collapse within Ken's kingdom. And then when Ken collapses, he comes back weeping and crying to Barbie and submits to Barbie. Barbie then says, Ken, the whole message was that instead of it being Barbie and Ken, you be Ken and I'll be Barbie. And, and we can be fine with each other. The, the, the men uh, who are, were under Ken then beg the women to be part of the female Supreme Court and achieve equality. And they literally say, well, then I guess the idea is that we have equality. The women all then respond to the men, you've not evolved to be ready to handle that responsibility yet. And she even says to one of the guys, just says, put me on the the women's Supreme Court. You're not ready for that. You might get a local court, uh, but no. No men on the Supreme Court because you guys just are toxically masculine and you're irrational are you serious yes men are irrational women build civilizations and do the black ops and do the warfare to do the intelligence operations i mean it's just like 
What? Then, Ken thinks he's going to get Barbie back with all his weeping and uh, beta sob stories. And she's like, talk to the hand because I'm going back to Earth world where I have real biological parts. And everybody was mystified by this because, spoiler alert, when Barbie leaves in the imaginal world and goes back to human world, the ongoing joke in the film is that because, you know, dolls don't have parts. Genitalia, as they're called by some in the technical fields. Well, Barbie decides she wants her parts. And then she goes to, at the end, the gynecologist. So the final scene is that Barbie's going to see a gynecologist, which is supposed to be funny, I guess, for the women that made this movie or whatever. It's, I don't know. But I think the point of that was um, Barbie's now here to save this world, right? The enlightened, sophisticated, celestial feminist who has fixed the heavenly rebellion in her world of the patriarchal oppressive tyranny. And she's now created the fairness world. She's become now incarnated. So here it does depart from some of the Gnostic narratives. She's become incarnated here. I think now with the mission to girl boss this world, she's going to get rid of, cause they'll probably make a sequel, right? If it made money, she's going to have to then girl boss the will bumbling will Ferrell and the Mattel corporation to unseat them from the tyranny of male patriarchal to toxic masculine dominance. So absolutely it was 100% Gnostic. Absolutely it was super feminist. So basically, yes, yeah, she is the Pistis Sophia, the Gnostic goddess who saves us from our poor masculine selves. By the way, if you want to support the show, you can via the Super Chat functions. Use these Super Chats there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was just kind of... Uh, I mean, there's a couple of things in this movie that were clever in, in terms of, like, the cinematography. I thought it was really clever the way that the ideal world is structured. That I did, I think, was neat. Uh, it's really trippy looking because it looks like a Barbie house or something, but... Um, and that right there, that's, that's your Barbie right there. That's, that's, that's the new Barbie coming out slow Barbie right there. Um, and by the way, they make it a point to say that Barbie could be anything. Dr. Barbie, lawyer Barbie, corporate CEO Barbie, right? So when she, she when she comes to the real world, you've got this sort of uh, Pinocchio, uh, make me a real girl narrative going on, and she becomes a real girl and says, "I'm going to see my gynecologist because I have my parts." In other words, now that I am master of my own destiny, and I don't have a kin man telling me what to do with my parts, that I'm supposed to be a slave in the kitchen churning out the babies with my parts. I will now determine the meaning of my parts. That's what that was about. And she's here to fix our fallen world. Now, this is the Gnostic dark goddess archetype, but I'm adding the dark goddess savior archetype to the lexicon. Because I started thinking about it. How many movies are given us now instead... Of, and they'll even use the biblical imagery, virgin birth, right? Incarnation, or actually a stepping into our uh, corrupted, you know, Gnostic lower realm or whatever, evil realm, to save us and bring us back to the ideal. And thankfully... The ladies are here to save us because us men has done messed it all up. And I was thinking of some other movies where this pops up and then I'm like, you know what? This is in a crap ton of movies. I can't even, there's too many to think of. So I started thinking, okay, uh, Fifth Element, Mila Jovovich, Lilu, Multipass, right? 
She's the incarnation of the fifth element, the ether. She's love or whatever incarnate. She's the new Gnostic savior in that future fake world religion they have that Ian Holm is the priest of. Uh, Jupiter ascending, right? Remember, Mila Kunis is basically the new goddess uh, savior chick. And the reason I say the dark goddess savior is because a lot of times they're these sort of wrathful, vengeful female resentment deities incarnated who, through the destruction of the patriarchy and their vengeance, brings about the new salvation, you see, right? And that's Mila Kunis, Jupiter ascending, was about that. And then I started thinking, oh yeah, all of those, uh, uh, what's his name that makes the freaking he made all the Mila Jovovich movies. And then the, he, he did, uh, uh, Luke Besson, right? Luke Besson. He's always got the female Gnostic archetype. Uh, Lucy. Then we get Scarlett Johansson in a bunch of movies where, she evolves into the goddess. She turns into the sentient black goo in Lucy, which is all about Lucy being that first stupid ass fake monkey, Lucy. Evolving into black goo and becoming a sentient female computer goddess. Uh-huh, sure. And the soy men eat this up, right? This the I the I think the the religion of the soy men is the nar the dark Gnostic goddess savior. That's their. That's who. That's why they're soy men, is they worship the soy goddess, basically. And they think if they serve her uh, in the metaverse, they're going to get access to you know some of that Scarlett Johansson boot. You know what I mean? Oh, well, I'm gonna have access in the metaverse to the digital version of. Whoever. No, you're just going to be put in a coon tank and put to sleep. <laughs> That's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> you're going to be you're going to be uh, going to be in that uh, coon tank six feet under. Because that coon tank is a trap. That's what I'm saying. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Thank you for those super chats. we got a nice little crowd here. If you would hit like and share, welcome everybody. Uh, we're having fun. We're going to be returning to a little more uh, of a serious topic, I think, in the next couple of days, where I've come across some really good uh, deep geopolitical analysis that we'll be commenting on. I haven't covered in a while. That's the background to the, the architecture of Mockingbird and Mockingbird 2.0. And Mockingbird 2.0 was really all of the Russia collusion P-gate stuff. So we're going to be doing a breakdown of that because you're going to understand that all of that P-gate stuff was all the same model of Mockingbird, but now 2.0 on the internet. Cyber Mockingbird, basically. And uh, I found a really good podcast that doesn't just tie in that. It ties that all of that in. Even up into the today, you know, present day Ukraine situa situation, if you understand my my drift here, if you catch my grift, <laughs> you down with OPP and Hammer? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPP and Hammer? Yeah, you know me. You down with CCP? Yeah, you know me. You down with OPP and Hammer? Yeah, you know me. You down with FSSP? Yeah, you know me. You know that this SSPX. Yeah, you know me. Uh, there's one more thing I want to say about Barbie, and then I forgot what it was. Oh, I forgot to get my. Uh... Anyway, no, it was obviously feminist Gnostic nonsense. Anybody couldn't see that is basically should uh, get fired from doing movie analysis. How about that? I, I, as the CEO of internet movie analysis, you fired. <laughs> Anybody that didn't see this movie was Gnostic. You fired. You're never allowed ever again by me to analyze any more movies. You fired. Just do your lips like a square and you could automatically do Donald Trump. You fired. No more movies. Gonna be wonderful without you. Thank you. You fired. 
No more movie analysis for anybody that got this one wrong. You're done. You're cooked. Your goose is cooked in the 10,000 degrees Celsius fires of the Hiroshima bombs. Oh, this. Can't reach my Carol Quigley. Come here, Carol. Come here, Carol. Larry Nichols. Hillary's a witch. <clears throat> yeah, my Trump is a little off because it's hot in here. <clears throat> it's a little too deep. Trump's not that deep. <clears throat> it's gonna be great. It's gonna be wonderful. Hillary, Hillary, Joe, Sleepy Joe, Sleepy Joe Biden. <laughs> That's better. <clears throat> I was a little too low there. <laughs> anyway, I think that's everything I want to say about Barbie. Um, yeah, okay, good enough. So I didn't get into all the depth that I wanted to, but hopefully you see how that's. Oh, uh, uh, that's right. Dark goddess savior archetype in the movies. Uh, Calypso, Pirates of the Caribbean. Remember her? Jock Sparrow. <laughs> Jock Sparrow. Me want you do one more thing for me. <laughs> this, ra- this turtle here is a razzies. Bruh, bruh. This turtle is a razzies. Yeah, exactly. Y'all remember my Jamaican man talking at you. Calypso, she doesn't she turn into a big old hurricane? Hurricane. Isn't that a rap song? Hurricane. She turns into a big rap song. <laughs> I mean, a big hurricane. And, uh, you know, flushes the Kraken down the, the ocean toilet, right? Remember that? Me go and flush this, yeah. Kraken down the ocean toilet now. Nah. <laughs> this Kraken is a rare Bruh, bruh. And I feel like I'm forgetting a big one. What? What's another? I, I wrote it down. I wrote down a list of all of the female goddess revenge archetypes. Ex Machina. You could argue that's another one, even though she's a robot, right? You know? Have you noticed they always make the Matrix what, the because the Matrix of the womb, right? They always make uh, Skynet. Is a she? Remember, it was Helena Bonham Carter, the Gnostic goddess, the Red Queen, Resident Evil. Is a she? Jaspira. What, uh, Miss Cleo, Gnostic Savior? <laughs> Dion Warwick, Gnostic Savior? I feel like. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Do a Robin Williams. I can't, I I can't do Robin Williams. I feel like I got a little bit of Robin Williams kind of Spurg energy in me though. But I, hopefully I feel like I'm actually kind of funny because I mean, Robin Williams is, I get what he's doing. I like the kind of stream of consciousness stuff. That's what I like to do. But I just don't think Robin Williams' stuff was funny. It's just kind of dumb. And I feel like, but I feel like I'm forgetting some really big female savior goddess movies. Anyway, oh, Children of Men. Remember that? Yeah, because in Children of Men, she has a virgin birth and it's a girl. Whoa. And that we just watched some other movie recently where the, the new Gnostic savior was a girl. Anyway, all right, let's move on to. Nappenheimer, credit to Jamie for that joke. I stole it, but I gave credit. And the first thing is that, you know, I had to refer back to my Quigley because nobody knows what Carol Quigley said about Oppenheimer. Nobody cares. Nobody listens to uh, any of this stuff uh, unless it's you smart people because you over here talking to to me. And I got to look in the index because I got so many notes that I can't tell anything about where it is. But I remember some pretty wild admissions from Quigley on this. 
And people are going to get mad and think that I'm saying, oh, everything's fake. I don't know. In fact, I don't claim to know. Let's see, 880s. 850 to 880 is, is the op number. I don't have any uh, knowledge of atomics. You know, if I, if, I, if I end up hanging out with Paul Atreides, Muad'Dib, if I'm hanging out with Muad'Dib and he teaches me atomics, then I will let you know the secret to atomics. But until then, I don't know. But what Quigley uh, admits is pretty wild. And we do know that it was uh, Laurel Canyon, Wonderland Studios, that the Trinity, New Mexico site, that film was produced there. Interesting. Why would it have to go to a premier film lab like that Disney had access to and all that, right? Um, so this is 100% propaganda. In fact, Quigley on the first page says much of what we know and think about this is that it's a lot of Hollywood stuff. Am I saying that all of this is fake? No, I'm not saying that because I don't actually know. I can't prove that. But I, what I can know and prove is that they're saying that this is a lot of propaganda. And I'm trying to find this, uh, this old article. I remember this from years ago. Yes. Here it is. It's admit it's here in this slate article about Laurel Canyon. See how my memory works. And then, uh, United States Air Force established uh, Lookout Mountain in 1947 to produce movies and the photographs of the nuke test. So the Oppenheimer stuff is literally where we get the Lookout Mountain Studios from. It was created for that. Military civilian filmmakers. Oh, wait a minute. So military in Hollywood. Exactly. Yeah. Disney, all of the big producers of the 40s. Capture footage of exploding bombs, and they brought it back to Laurel Canyon for editing and production. Interesting. Now, why does Quigley, in this uh, imp very important 17th chapter of Tragedy and Hope, see that? Nuclear rivalry in the Cold War. And I have to wonder, is... Chris Nolan over there, like, giggling a little bit because do you remember what was in Interstellar? Remember old Mike Kane is over there? And he's over there talking about Mafio, Mafio. The moon landings, the moon landings. They were faked. No, it's not him actually saying that. It's Michael Kane saying we had to leave Earth because Earth wasn't made for humans. Bunch of nonsense, right? But, uh, Matthew McConaughey goes to the local professor or the local teacher in the dystopian future. And they're like, well, America faked the moon landing. And then Matthew McConaughey's over there like, you trying to tell me we didn't go into space. You trying to tell me it's all fake and gay. We just went, we just, it's all fake gay. <laughs> and they're like, yes, it was all fake and gray. And then Michael Caine's like, there's a secret space program. There's a bloody secret spice program. And so then they're deciding, oh, we're going to have an off-world colony breakaway civilization. And you know the rest of Interstellar, right? So, but it's odd, and everybody pointed out at the time that, hey, wait a minute, why is uh, Christopher Nolan over here talking about secret space program and faking the moon landings and all this stuff? And now we're being told about Oppenheimer and the bomb. You dropped a bomb on me. I'm over here like George Clinton dropping bombs. Remember that old Onion article? Atomics and atomic propaganda. It's the first thing Quigley talks about. Now, I'm not making any statements because I don't know. And I was thinking about this this week because of uh, some of the stuff I put on Twitter that made a lot of people mad. 
And, you know, people love their stories and their narratives and they're wedded to them. And I don't care what you're wedded to. I mean, I do, but I don't, but I do. If you really want to believe in all that garbage from NASA, that's your, that you can do that. And the other thing is that people say, ah, oh, well, if you, if you doubt NASA, you must be a flat earther. That is a non sequitur. NASA lies, therefore fat earth. No, that's a non sequitur. So this is what throws people for a loop is they can't figure me out. They're like, wait a minute. I thought you was a true dot in the wool conspiracy theorist. No, no, no. You got it backwards, bro. You got it backwards, dog. How? My philosophy, my worldview is different from you. And most people. Most people think science, the science is settled, dude. We was all, we was monkeys. We was monkeys, dog. Science is settled. Well, as a philosopher, I know that that story has very little evidence behind it. So I feel completely justified being a skeptic about the Darwinian narratives. I don't find the philosophical argumentation convincing. But because most people don't study philosophy, they're thrown for a loop because everything I'm talking about sounds crazy to them. It's like, wait a minute. And they'll just assume that I have these other positions. Oh, you don't believe the mainstream science? You must be one of them crazy blah, blah, blahs. Put, put in it whatever you want there. You must be with Anatoly Fomenko and think that we're living in the year 1100 and there was no Middle Ages. <laughs> so I never talked about that. You must be a Tartarian. I'm the one that coined the term Tartarian, dog. No. Why can't you figure it out? Because you don't understand that in my worldview, metaphysical categories are more certain than scientific theories. So I, from my paradigm, my perspective, I'm completely justified in being a skeptic about any of these claims from mainline history and science. Because what's prior to that, my first principles that underlie the possibility of science or knowledge are metaphysical logical structures. That's more certain. And if the theories can't explain things like Transcendental categories, basic metaphysical principles like te teleology, causation. Then I'm within my rights to completely be, say, I, I don't find any of that convincing. It does not hold weight with me. Maybe it's true. Maybe all of the space stories are true. But if you're going to convince me of all the space stories and the way the planets form, and all this not the dumbest of all of these is the way the planets form. The belly button lint theory, which is the main dominant theory that the that dust just starts spinning in space. Dust just started spinning. Yeah, and it collected more dust and then it spun even faster and it got hot and it became a giant oven and then it collected more dust, which congealed and it became a planet. What? That is the dumbest thing in the world. And also, people don't understand that there are such a thing as large-scale scams. So, on many of these mainline scientific theories, I just withhold judgment. I say, I'm a skeptic on all this stuff. In fact, I don't have a problem with geocentrism. That might be true. I've seen uh, Robertson Genes make some interesting points about that. But I don't know. And I don't have, I don't have to choose something. So don't assume that I have a position, which you've never heard me say, because I question certain things. So that's the weird part is that people think, oh, he's so mean, he's dogmatic. I actually think I'm like super open-minded. Maybe you can convince me of long-term aeons of Darwinian evolution. What's the argument for that? You need to address the major problems. And nobody ever does that. They just like, flies in a jar. <laughs> Oh, you're so dumb, dude. Flies in a jar. How does flies in a jar tell me billions of aeons of this? And it doesn't. It doesn't tell me any of that. It's this huge leap you make. Again, maybe it is true, but you need to have a better argument than flies in a jar, dog. <laughs> Endogenous retrovirus, dog. Oh, boom. Got burnt. So don't assume that people have a position because they question the mainstream stuff. 
You question NASA, must be a flat earther. <laughs> no. I think a lot of that stuff's goofy. So what's your position? I don't have one. <laughs> I don't have to have one. Why do I have to have a position on every single bizarre theory? I don't. But I can tell you that from the philosophy perspective, the categories and preconditions of knowledge are more certain than your theories. Because what I'm talking about has to be the case to, to for you to have theories at all. So if my presuppositional categories are necessary for theory at all, then maybe I'm right about flipping those starting points. That's why all these normies that don't know anything about philosophy, they all think, philosophy's dumb, dude. We got science now. We got science now. <laughs> Science is a tool for theorizing about and understanding the natural world, and that's it. Nothing else. And real science, by the way, is not done by dorks like Dawkins and Hitchens sitting around speculating about life origins. That's theory. Real science is like engineering, dude. You ever think about that? How come a bunch of engineers aren't all over the TV telling us about science? I'd listen to them because they're actually applying these principles, proving that it works with their product, with their engineering capabilities. What has Richard Dawkins engineered? What has Neil deGrasse Tyson engineered to prove their theories? Maybe they have. And guess what? Something that freaking proves my point on all this is the quantum theory stuff. Because all the quantum theory stuff came in and up seated the Newtonian stuff. And in the movie that they make a big deal about this in the first third of the movie, if you can stay awake, if you can wipe the drool off because Oppenheimer has all these discussions with Werner Heisenberg about and uh, Niels Bohr and all these other people about quantum theory and how this underlies, you know, his approach to the questions of what will eventually be the bomb and all that. And uh, that part was kind of interesting. Like the first, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes, I was kind of into it. And then it just went like just the rest of the movie. It's just like this boring bureaucratic like deposition for like the rest of the movie and flashbacks to him uh, having a couple memories of sleeping with what's her face from midsummer so i just thought it was a super boring movie but there were a few interesting admissions that actually come up in quigley did you catch the world government discussion from robert downey jr and the united nations mentioned that he mentioned he says yes the united nations will come out of that and that's exactly what quigley says quigley says that the atomic energy commission and the Oppenheimer stuff was all engineered, not by Oppenheimer and Matt Dadbot over there from the military, but by the banking elite and Bernard Baruch. Boom, baby. They even mentioned Henry Luce. So <laughs> Robert Downey Jr. is playing, uh, what is it, a senator, Strauss, right, who was on this commission and he was supposed to be like the government, the le legislative angle of it. There's the military angle of it with Matt Dabbot over there telling them what to do with the project. And uh, meanwhile, he's investigated by the FBI because of the, oh, he's a commie and we think he's a red, the Soviet. And there's Klaus Fuchs, who was a Soviet spy, is there. So it, I just wanted to point out, though, that the very first thing Quigley talks about is the Hollywood element of all this. And Quigley says that a lot of what was going on in this period was aided that the arms race was aided by the narrative of the Cold War buildup. And Hollywood was a big part of that. And a big part of the Hollywood 10 and the, the investigating the Hollywood commies and all that, all these trad cats and people were like, oh, this is a commie. This is covering for commies. It's not covering for commies. It's pointing out that the Cold War 
was a dialectic, I think. I'm talking about Quigley is pointing this out, right? Um, I, I, I think... I mean, the Christopher Nolan movie is not exactly making Oppenheimer into some saint. It's, I think it's it's trying to do gritty realism and you know presenting him as a uh, a complicated figure because he's you know not an affable, uh, uh, um, amicable person. He he's supposed he's a womanizer. He leaves his wife and all this. He doesn't care for his child, and so he's not a good person. But oh, we must re- revere him because of the the scientific genius and. You know, Quigley, I'm going from memory here, but Quigley basically says, no, Oppenheimer was kind of like an organizational genius for this project. Um, He doesn't really speak of him like he was this master scientist. But rather, this is on page 885 of Tragedy and Hope, Oppenheimer, who had uh, communist socialist sympathies, was more of a cultural critic and an administrator. (laughs) What? And that nukes, quote, were Air Force propaganda. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't ICBMs or that there aren't. Maybe I have no, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that's what Quigley says. And by the way, he admits in, in this that Mal was aided by the OSS, which I've said for many years. And um, then we get to the McCarthy period. And so uh, Klaus Fuchs in these story and the Venona manuscripts and all that. I'm not saying that's not real. Uh, yes, there were Soviet spies. Yes, there were defectors. Uh, and this the Cold War kicks off in the very next chapter, according to Quigley, because of Stalin rejecting the Marshall Plan aid. And that is the beginning of the Cold War. Cold War begins with Stalin rejecting Marshall Plan aid in 1947. This is page 892 of Quigley. I think that's, I accept that, that's true. And then the Atomic Energy Commission scientist... create what is essentially a nuclear racket set up by Bernard Baruch. And Quigley says, not me, Quigley says, many of the members of this commission were scientifically ignorant. And he says they weren't really worried about it because they were ultimately had a goal of creating, this is pages 894 and 895, of creating the UN Security Council. So the justification for policing of the nukes is the nuclear dangers and war, which Quigley says is basically exaggerated. I'm going to read what he says. The Atomic Energy Commission functioned as uh, as a disappointment to the BAS scientists. This is the real scientists that were there. They thought it would be freedom from military influence and reduced influence influence on military uses of their nuclear fission tech, free from dis- dissemination of theoretical research, free dissemination of their research. Uh, however, they failed on every point. The Atomic Energy Commission operated in terms of weapons research and production and remained extravagantly secret, even on theoretical matters. And this was because of the scientific ignorance of most of the commissioners. <laughs> It was dominated by the Scientific Advisory Commission and the official statements of Oppenheimer. State Department Committee led by Dean Acheson and David Lilenthal and a second committee of citizens organized by Bernard Baruch spent most of 1946 engaged in the monstrous task of trying to work out a system of international control of nuclear energy. This task of educating the non-scientists fell to Oppenheimer, who gravely who gave dozens of brilliant extemporaneous chalk dusted lectures on nukes and physics. The final plan presented to the UN by Bernard Baruch in 1946 provided for an international control body like the Atomic Energy Commission, but but under the control of the United Nations. This became the UN Security Council. So this is where you get in the movie, Robert Downey Jr. saying, it's almost like we're we're finally going to get FDR's United Nations global governance. He says world government. (laughs) And then um, quickly goes into talking about the exaggerations of communist Soviet, uh, particularly here, uh, uh, Stalin, Stalin's capabilities. Okay. And remember, 
uh, not all communism is identical. This is a, a, a stupid mistake that tradcons and normie neocons and trad cats all they make this is they think that it was like this monolith of all the, the commies all working together when uh many of these trotskyites and frankfurt school people hated stalin and I'm, that doesn't make stalin a good guy that just that's i think that's a fact and you can't ignore that if that's a fact that's what i'm trying to say so just assume that it's this gi giant machine that works together as if the Manichaean dialectics of the Cold War is accurate. Oh, it's just this, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and we're the Jesus people and they're the atheists. No, it's not true. That's an ex that's a ridiculous exaggeration. As all of these high-level policy people are admitting. And that's why it annoys me when people are like, have you seen the Yuri Bezmenov video? Oh, boy, mind blown, dude. Oh, you mean the same one where he goes on to say that all the people in the... Eastern Bloc countries need Skittles. That video, that Bayes Trad video, is that the one you're talking about? And yes, he says that, for those of you that don't know, all you dummies out there that buy into the like base level propaganda. I'm not saying there weren't defectors. That is, I'm not saying that NKVD was good. I'm just saying that these are basic history facts, and I don't understand why people can't figure that out. There's so much propaganda about the Cold War. It was like The, the Cold War was like not... It was actually not even about bombs. It was like the propaganda bombs. The real nuclear bomb of the Cold War is propaganda, dude. And everybody was propagandized, especially freaking boomers. Meanwhile, the OSS and CIA are helping Mao out. <laughs> it's like in this period where the Cold War is kicking off, they're over there training Mao and his guerrillas. And Mao was at Yale in China. Skull and Bones set up the program which produced Mao. You didn't even know that, did you? But Yuri Bezmenov, dude. Anyway. So, in my view, uh, the money power elite in the West wanted a cold war eventually that's my view and so this movie it kind of dances around the edge of that a little bit but not really i mean there's just a few glimpses of it with robert down with the stuff robert downey jr says and he even mentions time life magazine and henry luce and he's they're like how do you know what henry luce is gonna publish and they're like oh because he's uh a friend of mine and he tells me ahead of time and, and we we collude basically to know what's going to be in time magazine right so it's like yeah because that was a skull and bones establishment publication absolutely 100 percent. david wimhoff's book shows it beyond any shadow of a doubt 800 pages of it the whole book is about that and out of this period this is the key section in uh tragic hope guess what rises out of the cold war the real result. Oh, the military industrial complex, CIA, NSA, national security council, the arms race, all of the cold war friction really produces the gigantic surveillance apparatus and the intranet, the interwebs, comes out of all of this you see the rand corporation from curtis lemay nato all those things the fear of communism was a tremendous justification for the ramping up of all of this and quigley says on page 916 that when they were saying that there was like a hundred thousand secret communists. It was really only a few, a, a few thousand. So by 1960, there were 3000. According to Quigley, here's what he says. The communists that Moscow actually controlled the United States were at their max 
I think he says the FBI estimated uh, about 75,000 in 1945. So apparently, according to Quigley and the FBI, the peak of Kremlin-influenced communism in the United States was 75,000 people in 1945. In 1950, that fell to 50,000. In 1960, it fell to 3,000. So certain stories, which are real stories, uh, Hiss, Benona, Fuchs, uh, Ethel and Rose, the Rosenbergs. Okay. Yeah. They're Soviet spies. Sure. But it is not this giant threat that's going to destroy the whole country. And they're, you know, everywhere they're is basically like the T E R R O R threat back then exaggerated. And he goes on to say that the red threat was exaggerated because it was perfect for the justification for all the buildup. Just like the military industrial complex, they did the same thing with the last 30 years of the T-E-R-R-O-R crisis. Much of which they aided. And guess what? It wasn't any different with the commies. Much of which the Western elites aided. Build up the enemy. Allow them to be a controlled managed threat that justifies your own buildup and then you dispense with the enemy which you basically managed the entire time managed in the sense of uh you know like a a, a lion on a leash is what i'm trying to say in fact there were even fake atomic spy stories completely made up completely planted and quickly covers that on page 920 uh, uh, most of the information about Soviet spies was uh, not secret, hidden information. It was just public news stories. Some of those were fake. And he does mention uh, fake nuclear stories and fake espionage again on 922. The red conspiracy red threat was largely trumped up. And he says, if we were really concerned about this, there wouldn't have been a program to send nuclear scientists to Russia. <laughs> but nuclear scientists were sent to Russia in a joint program. Oh, but we're also worried about all the, of the scientists uh, getting compromised by the NKVD and, uh, you know, sleeping with, uh, you know, Ulya and Khrushchev and... and uh, and drop off getting us nuked basically it's a bunch of it's a bunch of stories and i don't know why people can't get that because that doesn't mean that i'm saying that stalin is a good guy it's like it's not that hard to figure out but everybody wants these really simple kind of easy narratives right and that's when he goes on to say that uh people who he makes fun of the john birch society for not figuring out who was really running things? Because the John Birchers were the first conspiracy theorists, if you don't know, the first era of like, you know, grandpa era conspiracy people. And they pick, they figured out part of the picture, right? A lot of McCarthy type people. Yes. and But like Alex points out, McCarthy and a lot of the John Birch people, they actually started figuring out, hey, wait a minute. This isn't all Moscow and Beijing. This is a bunch of people in our establishment, <laughs> like David Rockefeller. And so they first kind of fell into this thinking, this trap, oh, maybe the commies have, maybe Moscow and uh, China have compromised David Rockefeller and the Carnegies and the Mellons and the, you know, all of these elite families. Because why are the families and the tax-free foundations supporting leftism and socialism? Because they're all commies. No, it's the other way around. Wealthy people have always funded and controlled and managed socialism, communism, you see. And we just still can't get people past that, that road bump. They just can't figure that out. They can't. That's a roadblock in so many people's minds. It's like an age, There's like an age drop-off, right? Like if you're above 50, you just can't ever believe that for whatever reason. I don't know really why. But. So there you go. Anyway. Some really good sections uh, in, in all this. The Quigley uh, era, uh, chapter 17. Really good stuff there. 
So hopefully that clears things up and people don't automatically assume that I have some kind of ridiculous position. A lot of this, a lot of the science stuff, I don't care. People can't figure out that a lot of science is propaganda, man. Uh, what about quantum physics? Well, my f- view is, and I, one of my essays in the Red Book, I cited, I think, Werner Heisenberg. Because Heisenberg says, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Werner Heisenberg, right? Doesn't he argue that the smallest particles uh, operate and have structure like platonic solids, right? He says it's more like Platonism at that level. Okay, well, that fits into my worldview perfectly. Is my worldview destroyed if that's not true? No. I don't have a problem saying, well, okay, maybe it's, maybe quantum physics is just a wild theory. And so a lot of people mistake theorizing and they just have this, this mystical sort of, they just think science is this, this Olympus council, right? There's a, there's a, at the universities, there's the council of science. And again, that's a bunch of movie crap. That's not how it works. People over there theorizing, that's fine. There's a place for theory. But I'm, I'm going to listen to an engineer before I listen to a quantum foam theorist. Because a quantum foam theorist is theorizing. Richard Dawkins, though, they're theorizing about Alien space sex and panspermia. That's a theory. So in the movie, as we'll say, uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. I just wanted to comment on that stuff because I think that's the most fascinating element. Crap. Is the stuff I mentioned. The movie is not that fascinating. (laughs) All that stuff I just said is way more fascinating and interesting than this movie. I guarantee you that. Um, unless you really want to sit in, uh, if you want the re- the virtual experience of a bureaucratic 1940s boardroom and being questioned by other bureaucratic, boring boardroom men. I mean, what the heck? And then one dumb humping sequence, which everybody was losing their mind over. I'm like, there's a million different movies with this exact same thing in it. So, <laughs> Hollywood's making our scientists into prawn stars. What? And then I heard this. This must have been viral marketing, I think. Because, I mean, it was just the whole movie was super boring. And people are saying they came away traumatized from this. Traumatized? I mean, maybe you can be traumatized from being extremely bored in a theater for three hours. (laughs) I mean, what? That had to be marketing. I can't imagine actually being traumatized from this. I mean, and people believing these stories of, which Quigley says a lot of this is just exaggerated. Um, so there's references to alchemy. There's references to uh, subtle references to what we what we call might call sex magic, because the phrase you know read this from the Vedas is right when they're in the midst of their intimacy, right? Because intimacy time is when you read the Vedas, right? <laughs> Out loud. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just silly, but there's a reason for that because it, he keeps referring back to the big bang, get it, get it. And then he's the new big bang, right? Because he's the destroyer of worlds and the creators of the creator of a new world, basically with uh, fusion and fission and which I take as a thesis, antithesis, dialectical synthesis, right? That, that's kind of what's the structure of this movie. Um, and they mention that famous phrase in the midst of the intimacy sequence, the bang, get it. And then um, she has them read the Sanskrit from the Vedas about you know, I've become destroyer of worlds or whatever. Anyway, uh, he is Prometheus. That's the thing. They keep referring to him as the American Prometheus throughout the movie. And so as Prometheus, he's stealing the fire of the gods to destroy worlds now. And he's there with his council, high council of science, which that's, that's how normies think it, this works, right? There's like, there's this high council of science with Oppenheimer and uh, Ed Tell, Edward Teller, 
and all these scientists sitting around, right? And by the way, do you know Edward Teller, not just the Manhattan Project guy, he's also the father of atmospheric, atmospheric aerosol spraying or geoengineering. That is on record what Edward Teller is known for, as well as being on the High Council of Oppenheimer Science, you see. The other biblical archetypal references are that he says that the nukes, when they, when this goes off, it's a pillar of fire in the desert, you see. So there's this Moses Egyptian uh, exodus narrative, the pillar of cloud and fire. He calls it the divine power where he says that we will detonate this in the city of the three-person God. Trinity, the three-person God, because they're the new gods, you see. And by the way, that's in my book where I cite Strange Angel about uh, Jack Parsons and all that and Trinity site. So maybe even subtle references to secret societies and psychological warfare with the idea of the ritual dividing of the atom and the release of energy. Uh, so there is perhaps an esoteric component to this movie. I think you could, you see, I see traces of that with the biblical references and him actually saying that we're going to blow this up at the site of the three person God. And, and Matt dad Bob's like, what's the three person God? And he says, Trinity, New Mexico, because he's the new God. You see who are the new gods? The stars of science. And they actually talk about them as, as if they're sort of cult stars. But the cult now is the cult of the super weapon. And you should go read the Collins Brothers' excellent article on that called The Cult of the Super Weapon. Because it talks about, exactly as Qu Quigley was saying, the psychological warfare components of the cult of the super weapon gave the impression that America now had the ability to destroy worlds. The cult of the super weapon. The bomb almighty. If you watch Planet of the Apes 2, I recommend it because this is in Planet of the Apes 2. They actually worship the bomb almighty. And they have an organ and they have a liturgy of the bomb. I'm not joking. You should go watch it. It's a, it's a good B movie. It makes this point, the cult of the super weapon. But this movie is not really going that deep it kind of dances around the edges of uh some of the stuff i'm talking about from a quick from quickly and whatnot but it falls back into your typical sort of normie approach where everything is as normie history has told us um nothing is uh exaggerated and out of placed out of accord with reality except maybe the commie stuff is is, is shown to be exaggerated which maybe that's true um, but you have Truman basically, who was a committed Freemason calling the shots. Uh, I don't, sorry. Tr the president doesn't, doesn't call the shots, right? He's over there. The, the shot caller. Oh, we're going to nuke these people. We're going to bomb these people. I'm going to call the shots because I'm the prez. The prez calling the shot. No, sorry. The prez submits to the people with zillions of dollars. The dude that makes $200,000 a year does not submit to the people that make zillions of dollars a year. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, he does submit to them. Okay. Barack Obama doesn't tell David Rockefeller what to do. And out of all this is where we get the Booms Day clock. All of this stuff was like the greatest psyop in the history of the world uh, prior to and the whole Cold War stuff, I'm saying. The Cold War is basically a giant exercise in mastering psychological warfare. Jump onto your desk, Boomer, for the nuke blast shall get ye unless you stop, drop, and roll. No, I'm sorry. Stop, drop, and roll ain't going to do nothing if a nuke blast is coming according to the story of the nuke blast, right? And we've covered some of these uh, propaganda classics too, by the way, like um, what's the Steve Gutenberg Reagan era nuke movie that freaked all the boomers out. Remember that? Supposedly this movie just scared the crap out of everybody. The, the, uh, we covered Jamie and I covered, and I just, I just went blank. The last day 
the last. Y'all help me out. My mind's going blank here. This is where we get the Boomsday Clock. Remember my video? The Boomsday Clock video, my original cr cringe course. A lot of people don't know there was an original cringe course song about boomers. The Boomsday Clock. Instead of the Doomsday Clock. Because the Doomsday Clock is a, is a stupid terrifier thing that's supposed to terrify the crap out of you. Maybe I changed it to boomer music, boomer tunes, I think. There it is. Look at that. Don't blow us all up, Gordy. Let's see if I can play this. No, it won't work. Anyway, you can go watch this later. Uh, I was reading at the time the Rand Corporation book by Alex Abea. And I was reading, I think I was reading Quigley too in these chapters. And I was like, just laughing at all this, boom, the, the doomsday clock and all this nonsense. Like that's such an obvious psyop. And everybody gets scared and they roll that stupid thing out every now and then. Remember they tried to roll the, the doomsday clock out like a year or two ago that we're all, oh, we're right next after COVID. <laughs> they were like, oh, we're right next to midnight, dude. The world's about to blow up. And then when uh, the Ukraine war, oh, bro, we're about right next to, to midnight. And it's all the same idiot. You're like, what is this? Oh, it's just a bunch of normie science people. Atomic scientists. Oh, the same people like Oppenheimer and these people, right? And it's just some freaking woman and a bunch of nerds over here moving a big fake clock. It, this, it doesn't mean anything, dude. It's nothing. Look at these fake ass people over standing here. Look at this dude. 51 minutes. Like I'm going to watch this. Can you imagine who... 180,000 people watched this. Who watched the whole thing? That's what I want to know. 2023 Doomsday Clock. Oh, shoot. Well, as long as, as long as we got Argentine science girls. Do we got an Argentine science girl? Yes, check. Do we got, she got glasses. Uh oh, we got a Normie Novus Ordo Archbishop. Check. Do we have a purple hair social justice? Check. Okay, look at these people. This is science, people. This is science. Lalita Sundaram. Purple haired freak with his eyes going in different directions like he's possessed. S.J. Beard. And Hayden Belfield, the Center for the Study of Risk. Existential Risk. <laughs> so basically, just made up nonsense. People just making up titles. What in the world? So these are the scientists wearing his pink hoodie telling you that the, the boomsday clock is two seconds to midnight. We got Kamala, Kamala over here. Kamala Harris over here. All good. Another uh, Latinx. Nice. Nice. We got, well, we're, the ratios are good. I've only seen one, uh, one or two men. I've seen uh, all women so far. So I know this is fair and balanced science. We got the ladies over here represent. And then we got this guy here. Very reputable, credible. We got boomers represented and we got also the Orient represented. Nice. Grandma's over here with uh, Chow Yun Fat. You got a uh, random British looking man, very scientific. Who else we got? Who's over there in the green hiding out? Whoopi Goldberg over here doing some science. Set us straight. Uh, Telly Savalas over here. 
sciencing us up. My grandma's over here. Chow Yun Fat. And then we got the Council of Science. Boom, boy, look at that Council of Science. Where the beakers at? Where the test tubes at? I like it. I like it. I believe it. And then they uh, they set the Baboom's Day clock for us. So boomers, watch out. Because this uh, the end is nigh. A lot of science going on there. A lot of science going on there. So you see... Uh, Definitely not propaganda. Definitely science. Anyway, that was enough of that nonsense. I'm done. These movies are stupid, dude. Uh, if you would hit like and share, let's get to these super chats. Super chat. Super chatty. TJ says for $3, do they explain where Ken got his Franken beans? Uh, Ken doesn't have Franken beans. So actually in the movie, Ken never gets Franken beans. But Barbie does. So Barbie gets her parts. Travis, $30. Thank you so much, Travis. By the way, support the show via the Super Chat function. Uh, we got several Super Chats. You guys have been generous tonight. I want to remind you, too, that we have a show sponsor, and that show sponsor is Chalk.com. The best supplements you can get, like the She Legit. Too legit to quit. She Legit, baby. Mental focus and clarity. You want to you wanna set up the real kingdom? You need some of that she, she legit for mental focus and clarity. You need some of that Tong Cataly for boosting your testosterone. See, I've already, the, the Tong Cataly is not in here because I've already taken that bottle. I've already upped my toxic masculinity. Have you? Well, you better. Head on over to chalk.com. Use the promo code J50. That's J-A-Y-5-0. If you look in the show description... You'll see the promo code there, J50, that's J-A-Y-5-0, in the show description. You will also see the links for all of the other things that you can get to support the show, to support me, support my work, including the philosophy course that we taught with Richard Grove, 12 lectures, 29, 30-ish hours, somewhere in there. It's a lot of hours, especially if you count all of the Q&A. You can get that philosophy course right there in the Autonomy Agora Marketplace link. You can get signed copies of my red book, the gigantic 660 page tome of all of my essays on geopolitics and philosophy and theology. You can get uh, my other books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, in the show description at the shop. And yes, all of the copies are signed. So everybody always asks me, can I get signed copies? They're all signed. That's why you don't get them from Jeffrey Bezos. Travis says for $30, spit that hot, dire fire for us, Big Daddy. I added a little bit to that. You should have said hot, dire fire. But thank you for the super chat. BMX 1966, great stuff. Thank you so much, long time super chatter BMX. BMX 1966, again, $10. Once again, this is a great intro slasher. Who does your intros? Everybody asks me. Uh, it's on the screen. It says uh, buy amid the ruins. That's who. <laughs> thank you so much. BMX, longtime Super Chatter supporter. Love you guys so much. One compliment, 377. Get Curtis Yarvin on. Um, I don't know Curtis. I'll be happy to have a chat with him. Uh, everybody says you need to talk to, to Curtis, a Neo Reaction Luminary, and I'd be glad to talk to him. $805. Alternative analysis. Barbie is the patriarchy. Bro, come on. Y'all got to be joking if you're having to go that far, right? I mean, maybe you're just joking. Ken is. Uh, the representation of women's strife. <laughs> okay. I mean, if that's where y'all who have the alternative analysis are having to go to, to make it work, then uh, you're still fired. You fired. You're still fired from doing movie analysis. You're not allowed to, but I will go ahead and read your super chat since you sent me five bucks. Patriarchy is oppressive. Feminism is created. The movement becomes oppressive. Patriarch is redefined to appease the feminist. And then Barbie as a Christ figure descends on to earth to spread ideology. No, I'm sorry. That one don't work, dog. Turtle Thames, $1. Do you have opinions on nuke? Again, uh, I did cover that when I got to the section on what I can and can't prove. Uh, so anything that is a an authority claim from the system in terms of like normie science, I don't have any problem with it being true. Uh, unless it contradicts my presuppositions, but I'm also not just going to accept it 
because it is stated to be the majority belief of most of the scientists or because the authority says that it's the case. Because I also know from many years of studying psyops and geopolitics that the authority structure lies all of the time. And everybody knows in the last three years, this, the authority structure has lied immensely. And that's part of the governance of mankind is that governments lie. Empires lie. Now, does that mean that everything is then false? No. So how do we know? Well, we don't. So we have a likelihood, uh, you know, it's like sort of a scale. But for me, my scale begins with the things that are most certain are not bizarre theories that come and go. Like most people. Who's the science? The science. Well, the science nowadays on all these normie science sites says that black holes are proven to be false. I remember in my Facebook feed years ago, there was a, a day where the same science publication, right? Like science.org or whatever, space.com. I don't remember what it was, but it was like, one thing was like black holes now proven to not exist. And literally the next post from the same thing was black holes now proven. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. So I am literally agnostic on all of these things. Not because I am just contrarian, but just simply because I have no way to verify all of these theoretical claims. And that doesn't mean that I think that, that maybe they are true. So like, what's going on at CERN? I don't know. <laughs> I don't claim to know. And I don't care if people have theories, but I don't think that somebody turned CERN on and uh, the Mandela effect happened and now all the, the screenplays from 30 years ago got altered. Okay, I don't believe that. That doesn't make any sense. But maybe there's uh, elements in simulation theory where we could find analogies and parallels that actually show that the world is ordered and structured. So I could take things from simulation theory about the world having geometric forms and pattern and structure without adopting the idea that everything is a simulation, you see. So I'm not bound to any of these dumb theories, and I don't care, ultimately, what the in other words it doesn't bother me if there's a bunch of theories you see and everybody wants to have you know everybody wants to jump to the craziest stuff like because if we don't really know what cern's doing oh then they must be altering the berenstain bears vhs tapes from 30 years ago <laughs> i mean that's just crazy dude that's just crazy look what's a more likely explanation for berenstain bears People were typing out the name and they just misspelled it. And they thought it was Steen and Stain, you see. Isn't that a lot more likely that people just mis misspelled stuff? Then they, they turned CERN on and it flipped all of the VHS tapes from 30 years ago. <laughs> this is ridiculous. It was more likely that everybody was lied to about a thousand year period in history and the Byzantine emperors all concocted it and tricked everybody and all the apostolic succession is false or no, actually there's, there was history is, you know, the last 2000 years is fairly accurate. I mean, if you're, if you believe Christian history, you wouldn't believe that stuff. I mean, maybe we just don't know a lot about Tartaria. Doesn't mean there was a giant world mud flood or, I mean, what? I mean, isn't it more likely that buildings sink into the ground over time than that there was a giant hidden empire? And by the way, I'm pretty open-minded about megaliths and hidden civilizations. I don't... Sure, okay, maybe there are. But I'm just a lot more skeptical on a lot of these things. That's all. Uh, by the way, you think I'm crazy. Oh, uh, he's... Look how dogmatic he is. No, no, no. I'm very open-minded, you see. It's not what you think. In fact, I've been watching, I've been doing a little side study on my own. Just a little side study in my, what do you do in your free time? I study other things that I'm not normally into. So lately I've been in, on this kick and I'm going to start doing some streams on this uh, about ghost and paranormal stuff. 
Because I'm starting to side more and more on, no, actually, I think ghosts are real now. And I don't know how to explain all that, but that's okay. I'm, I'm okay not having to explain everything. And I, we'll get into this more. I'll do some streams on it. But so basically in the last couple of years, just as a side project for fun, I've been watching tons and tons and tons of ghost and paranormal videos. Why have I, did, well, because first I was just doing it for fun, just to, you know, click around and watch something dumb in my spare time. So I've been watching a lot of James LaFleur's videos and I've been watching slap tan videos and I've been watching uh, bizarre bub videos. And the more you watch of these, the more I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. I don't think all of these are people just faking them. Now I think what's likely here. Well, what's likely is there will be some fakery and sometimes these are fake, right? A lot of these UFO videos are obviously fake. They're stupid CGI. However, a lot of videos of people's nanny cams and house cams. I don't think all those are fake. I think that there might actually begin to, we're starting to see more paranormal phenomena. Uh, I don't have an opinion on cryptids. There could be a species that we haven't, there's new species discovered all the time. Uh, I don't think there's a chupacabra, but it wouldn't destroy my worldview if there is. Um, do I think that spirits or beings can manifest? I think maybe they can't. I don't know how it works, but I'm starting to think, yeah. Because I've watched in the last two years hundreds of videos and clips on this. Just, as again, as my side project study. And I would say two years ago, I was very, very super skeptical anti-ghost. Uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side. Right. I'm like, no, nah, actually, I think uh, I'm, I'm more on that. So I think there are ghosts now. And I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it is. Aliens. No, I don't believe in aliens. Now, there are demonic aerial phenomena that I think are inexplainable. And. So you see what I'm saying? So I'm pretty open minded about stuff, I think. But I find it harder to believe that. Out of these probably again hundreds of i've probably seen a thousand or maybe two thousand in two years two thousand various clips of sort of paranormal phenomenon uh and i would say just guesstimating i would say maybe 10 to 20 percent are fake and staged um maybe 30 40 percent are inexplicable unknowns and then the other ones are like, those are pretty, that's pretty strong, right? And I've watched, so, I mean, I'm not a video analyzer, so I can't say for sure. But I'm just saying that this is my analysis, my opinion. Now, if a person tends to side on the, oh no, I think most of these are fake. Okay, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Like, it's okay. <laughs> like, because I, I, I would say again, two years ago, I probably would have thought, no, most of these are fake. But now I'm starting to think, no, I think a lot of these are not fake. So, yeah, I'm a little more open-minded on that stuff. So, you, yeah, you could say there are no ghosts, it's all demons. You could say that. However, in our eschatology, in our immediate state, I mean, uh, you know, in the life uh, of the soul after death, I mean, there's periods where the soul is still here. Uh, doesn't Father Rose talk about, you know, the tradition of uh, two to three weeks of the soul still being here? And we don't know what it's like in ghost time, right? In the next dimension, three three weeks might be three years or 300 years. I don't know. So we don't really know how all that stuff works. So it might be ghosts and demons, or maybe they're all demons. I don't have a problem either way. I'm open-minded about these things. But I do not believe in extra biological entities flying here on spaceships from other planets that crashed here that we re-engineered their technology. That's a bunch of baloney, 100%. Uh, I do think there's demons, angels, spirits. Um, some of these cryptid videos, I don't know. I don't know what they are. I mean, it's just, I guess, you know, again, it could be fake. It could be anything. So I'm open-minded. Uh, what do y'all think? Um, but I have to say, uh, when it comes to, if you were looking for these kind of fun videos, 
uh, James LaFleur's videos are kind of out there. I mean, he, he gets a lot of like really wild speculation, glitch in the matrix type stuff. I don't really buy most of that stuff's goofy and silly. Most of the UFO alien videos are garbage. Uh, but there's a few things I can't explain. So, but if you're looking for the best ghost demon videos, um, bizarre bub usually collects the best of those. Those are pretty solid. And then the slap tam is kind of an intermediate between those two. Yeah, I just don't think a lot of all this stuff's fake. I mean, it's just like, is everybody faking videos? I mean, what's more likely that I think it's more likely that 10 to 20% are faking these videos. Anyway, you, you get, y'all get the idea. We'll talk about this more. Uh, I'll, I'll lay out my, my theory and analysis on this. in uh upcoming streams that we do bobby a dollar do you think freemasonry is a past or present threat i don't think it has the influence that it used to but i mean it still has the degree of influence and it still has an ideology that is uh, antithetical to ours um it's hard to believe they have a major influence when the membership is declining yeah, I think that what's rising is stuff like witchcraft, you know, out, outright uh, occultic stuff and uh, outright, you know, satanic groups. Um, but I mean, there's still, you know, quite a few boomer Freemasons and powerful Freemasons, I'm sure. Jesse Branch, $3. Did Enoch and Elijah become the angels Metatron? No. Uh, Enoch and Elijah are Enoch and Elijah. Uh, so Metatron is uh, Gnostic, Kabbalist, uh, stuff we don't believe. BMX 966. I can't wait to hear your views on ghosts and paranormal. Well, I don't really have a lot of uh, theorizing. We're just going to maybe walk through some of the examples and get people's takes. And one reason I want to do this is that I want people to, because I've noticed that a lot of these things that pop up, this is a great experiment because it shows us, for example, that individual pieces of data don't necessarily tell us whose paradigm is right. And we see this with these kinds of things all the time because individual pieces of data can be can fit into multiple paradigms. And in philosophy, in the philosophy of science, as you guys know, this is called the problem of the underdetermination of data thesis. Right? A lot of data can be equally viable in various models. So just having a lot of data doesn't necessarily tell you which model is correct. And you could apply that to arguments like, oh, well, Jesus was resurrected. So uh, uh, the apostles changed their mind and became strong after the resurrection and they were weak prior to that. So therefore the resurrection of Christianity is true. Well, that just means that they had a change of character. How does that prove the whole religion to be true? Or the idea of if you can prove scientifically that Jesus rose from the dead, then all of Christianity is true. Well, I mean... Elijah, uh, you know, other people in the Bible rose from the dead or arose other people from the dead. So in other words, the resurrection of Christ doesn't mean anything without the rest of the story of Christianity. So it's a holistic thing you see. So these are fallacies. And when it comes to like the ghost paranormal clips and videos, none of these in themselves necessarily can hands down prove anything because we a lot of the videos we don't know their origin we don't know what's going on and yes they could be fake they could be cgi they could be whatever just you know people playing around with photoshop who knows right but it does seem implausible that they would all be fake okay well if they're if they're not all fake then some of them require other explanations which in many cases don't seem to immediately have a scientific causal explanation but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have a scientific causal explanation and a lot of times in this kind of uh, process people in the comments uh, actually do give good debunking information so there is a place for genuine debunking but debunking can become its own worldview right like michael Shermer, skeptic magazine that's its own weird belief system, which precludes all kinds of things. And it can't justify itself. You see, it's its own religion. And that's why every skeptic person 
the skeptic magazine reader, the Shermer types. That's why they always believe literally every establishment position. Oh, don't question the Big Nine event. Don't question Koof. Don't question Stabby's. Don't qu- see what I mean? Oh, so you're just a voice for the, you're a mouthpiece for the establishment because you're just another type of religion, right? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Down the line, every establishment belief, like a check, like a perfect checkpoint or checklist. BMX says, I can't wait to hear about ghosts and paranormal analysis. Well, I want y'all to, uh, to come with me because guess what? This audience has the highest IQ out there. I'm serious. We got a lot of high IQ people. Uh, so I want, I want y'all to chime in and comment when we do some of these upcoming ghost paranormal unexplained topics and no i don't believe in bigfoot that's dumb bigfoot's fake and gray uh bigfoot by the way if darwinism was true there ought to be bigfoots there ought to be we ought to be seeing some damn bigfoots okay sasquatch ought to be i'll put i'll put it this way if the bigfoot crowd which is a bunch of goobers can prove bigfoot to me then i might start thinking Okay, maybe Darwinism is true, <laughs> but I don't think you can prove Bigfoot because all the Bigfoot videos are dumb. So anyway, I think some of the most convincing is uh, people that have their, this is my other thesis I want to, this is why I'm saying this. What is different about nowadays than any time in history? Well, guess what? Not only are surveillance cameras everywhere and they got more and more prevalent in the last 20 years we know this not only does everybody have a cell phone with greater quality cameras almost everybody has like you know super hd 4k phone cameras now right guess what else now like never before almost everybody with middle upper middle class housing not maybe not everybody but it's becoming everywhere there are cameras everywhere home security everywhere so in other words if ghosts entities whatever if those things are true if they do exist do now is the time <laughs> we ought to be seeing them on cameras everywhere because people are putting cameras in in every room of their freaking house. Now to me, houses, cameras inside the house, this is getting, that's invasive. Okay. That's like, I don't want Alexa and Jeff Bezos being able to, you know, hack into my house and watch me. That's too far for me. However, a lot of the world doesn't care and there are cameras everywhere. So my theory is that, well, if you've got cameras everywhere more than ever in the history of the world, and especially now with everybody getting the home security systems, we ought to be seeing a prevalence of these types of phenomena. And it looks to me like there's a lot of that. Now, again, that's not, it's evidences, not proof. We don't know. It's still up in the air. Uh, so I don't, I mean, maybe if you were firsthand seeing, you know, some inexplicable thing like books flying off the shelf and hitting you or I don't know what, right? You're levitating over your bed at night or something. I don't know, <laughs> right? Or a phantasm appears and speaks to you, something like this, right? Like maybe then it's like, okay, that's hardcore empirical evidence. Um, anything we see on the internet is within the domain of, you know, ultimately not definitive, but my, my thesis again, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, it looks, so if we got cameras everywhere, we ought to be seeing stuff everywhere and we are seeing a lot of things. That's my, that's what I'm starting to think, but I could be wrong. I'm not wedded to this. So we'll be looking at some of that, uh, Thank you for those super chats. Rat dealer for a dollar. Is it uncommon to feel lonely and orthodoxy in America? 
Uh, I guess it depends on whether you're in a, like if you're in an ethnic church and you're just like, like a, you know, regular cracker man or a regular Southern man and you're in a, um, I don't know, Greek or Russian church and everybody else is foreign, you might feel that way. Um, you said you're in an Antiochian church. Well, sometimes Antiochian churches are all, uh, Arab. So maybe if you're, you know. So the, the solution to that is convert your friends. <laughs> then you'll have some friends in your, in your church. Uh, head on over to Grand Theft World, uh, our partner podcast over on Rockfin. R-O-K-F-I-N, that show, that is linked in the show description. And uh, I'll lay out my thesis on uh, ghosts and stuff and all that better 